Hello and welcome to my paper on programming survival, controlling ignition in Ramesh Nam's Nexus trilogy. Let us start at perhaps an unusual place. The ending of the middle part. Crux, the second novel ends with Su Yong Shu, a former human turned sentient AI, saving herself from destruction by downloading as much of herself as she can into her daughter's post-human brain while her husband can only watch helplessly. The focalization is on the husband, called Chen Pang, as he sees that his monstrous child was broken and reformed, possessed by his even more monstrous wife. Pang cannot do anything because his wife has taken control of his brain. He was a slave now and she cared nothing for his pleas because he has been torturing her for monetary gain ever since she was uploaded and came under his control, she's now taking his, her revenge. The book ends with Shu successfully re-sculpting her daughter's brain to host her and her husband uh, obeying her command to come to her and kneel. Chen Pang rose and came to her and did as his goddess commanded. The language of this passage is striking in its terrifying characterization of what the text explicitly calls post-humans. Su Yong Shu is even more monstrous than her daughter, who was born more than human herself. The human husband is her slave, and she his goddess, commanding his every move. This view is indicative of anti-post-human anxieties portrayed in the trilogy. Pang sees Shu as non-human, more powerful and simultaneously a danger to the continued survival of Pang himself. This then is a trilogy that is fundamentally about the future of the human race in the face of sentient AI and post-humans. It thematizes survival on two levels. On the one hand, there is the continued survival of humanity. There is an explicit debate as to whether humans cease to exist as post-human uh, cease to exist as post-humans come into being, or whether post-humans are surviving humans, with um, the ultimate conclusion being decidedly in favor of the latter. On the other hand, the action-filled action plot threatens the character's survival in, in a much more urgent and immediate manner. The technology underlying what the text itself calls the next major leap in human evolution primarily involves cognition and is depicted in very computer-oriented terms. You can see here the trilogy um, with the publication dates uh, between 2012 and 2014. Um, first and the last one won an award. So it, it depicts cognition in very computer-oriented terms. It, also corresponds to Catherine Hale's quote, point, of view, point of view characterized by the assumptions outlined in her seminal, uh, seminal monograph, How We Became Post-Human, um, published in 1999, something that will come as no surprise to those familiar with her work. Beginning in the year 2040, um, Nam's books, the Nexus trilogy, feature the eponymous nanodrug in its fifth iteration, developed by protagonist Caden Lane and his neural engineering friends. They have managed to develop, develop the drug so that it is programmable and permanently resides in users' brains. The first book depicts the US government's attempts and ultimate failure to suppress the distribution of Nexus 5 um, all over the globe in a post-cyberpunk thriller, thriller plot there's a tongue twister. Uh, books two and three deal with the misuse of the technology, as well as social unrest, terrorism, and then threat of a vengeful AI. From the very beginning of the first book, Nexus, the drug Nexus 5 is introduced as being able to program cognition, presenting cognition as computer-like and physical processes as almost mechanical in their predictability and operation. Next is the book begins um, with Caden at a party, testing a newly written piece of software called Don Juan. Yeah. Uh, it is meant to successfully lead him through a hookup. In this process, however, Caden is no longer in charge of his own responses, but the program is. He watches carefully, clinically, as Don Juan moves his body's responses. A slight smile 
release of oxytocin, dilation of capillaries in his cheeks. The program here controls minute changes to um, a girl leaning closer to him. Now this control extends to verbal reactions as the software sifts through possibilities presented in square brackets that visually underline the idea of a computer program. Yeah, I love to dance. Sure, what kind of music do you like? If I'm with a pretty girl like you. After making his choice in milliseconds, um, input spikes at nexus nodes attached to neurons in the speech centers of cadence frontal and temporal lobes, from where nerve impulses race to motor, motor, co motor cortex and from there to the muscles of his tongue and jaw, his lips and diaphragm. Again, one of the striking aspects about this passage is the almost mechanical description of the process that the program's instructions trigger. By almost mechanical, I mean automated and with discrete parts, each of which is connected to the next one. The image is kind of that of a signal being forwarded from one part of the body to the other, triggering either the next part or the, um, uh, the next part of the process or, or a movement. Each step is predictable, predetermined and automatic. It is also striking that there is no room for ambiguity or uncertainty as everything is categorical, uh, ca categorized, quantified and controllable. This cor corresponds to Hales's analysis of cybernetics and a suggestion that, quote, the post-human view privileges informational pattern over material instantiation, so that embodiment in a biological substrate is seen as an accident of history rather than an inevitability of life. What Hale summarizes here is present in the passage I just analyzed. Although there is a fair amount of description of physical elements in the passage, the signal, the information, is the most important part. This is even more obvious um, in the descriptions of how Nexus works. It enables users to directly communicate with the minds of other drug users. At a party, um, another protagonist, Samantha Sam Cateranes, experiences the sound of many voices. But more than that, more than sound, information, meaning, emotion, excitement, giddiness, apprehension, all there. So information and meaning are directly communicated to Sam. When the DJ puts on a song, she suddenly knows not only the name of the song, but, um, and the group as well, but also the inspiration behind it. It came to her in a flash. She simply knew it as if she'd always known it. They just beamed that into my head, she exclaims. And here the metaphor of light, um, so flash, beamed into her head, further contributes to the impression of direct, disembodied, instantly transmit transmitted information. From the post-human perspective, the body is there to be controlled. Hails again. Um, the post-human view thinks of the body as the original prosthesis we all learn, learn to manipulate, so that extending or replacing the body with other prostheses becomes a continuation of a process that began before we were born. In the Nexus trilogy, prosthetic limbs, um, physical enhancements and genetic manipulation abound. Manipulating the body is depicted as even more comprehensive, however, when the Nexus drug allows users to control other users' bodies, um, just like Su Yong Shu controls her husband at, in, in the example at the beginning of this paper. When such control is introduced for the first time, um, it is in a playful manner, in a harmless manner, at the party where Sam uses Nexus. Kate and her pass a pair of people who are moving oddly, clumsily, giggling and laughing. He explains that they call the game that they, these two people are playing a uh, push-pull and that the two are using Nexus to move each other's bodies. 
The technology driving humanity's future as post-humanity thus conceptualizes human cognition and bodies as controllable, programmable even, through quasi-disembodied forces. As I see it, however, there is need beyond Hales's call for um, emergence, reflexive ep epistemology, distributed cognition, embodiment, uh, and more generally, a dynamic partnership between humans and intelligent machines in lieu of the liberal humanist subjects manifest destiny to dominate and control nature. Um, so Hales famously criticizes this disembodiment and at the end of um, how we became posthuman calls for just these, um, these things I've just listed. So at the end of the first book, Cade releases all the information about how to pursue, produce the drug. Um, he releases this information over the internet. Although various governments attempt to stop the spread of this information, they fail. The spread is presented in viral terms. Uh, its, its success and ultimately the res resulting evolution of humans into post-humans is presented as inevitable. Um, I'm not going to read this. Um, just suffice to mention the very last bit. Um, every hour more variants of the package appeared, mutated, replicated. So progress cannot be stopped. In a sense, whoever joins what they call the ma next major leap in human evolution, simply going with the flow of history is more likely to survive and certainly more likely to be part of the future of humanity. Although the Nexus trilogy grapples with the impact of technology, as well as ethical implications, um, global structures and dynamics, including those driving and opposing this evolution, are depicted as overwhelmingly powerful. There are some debates about personal responsibility, but little to no examination of how to introduce accountability beyond um, the individual. So whoever, who, who stops the people abusing this technology um, is the question. The answer to this problem can be found in Hales' On Thought, published 2017, in which he argues Instead of control, effective modes of intervention seek for inflection points at which systemic dynamics can be decisively, decisively transformed to send the cognitive assemblage in a different direction. So survival in the face of post-human cognition is, the Nexus trilogy suggests, not only possible, but necessary in the form of survival as post-human. However, it presents the paradox of a future in which human cognition and bodies are programmable, but in which one can but submit to the global forces driving this development. It would be, desir it would be desirable, I believe, to find a less polarized model that leaves room for uncertainties, embodied contexts and modes of interve intervention, as well as possibilities to influence structures that go beyond uh, individual responsibility so that, human, so that humans uh, may not just survive, but live and thrive.